Hey, hi there everyone. It's Nick Maley here again at the Yoda Guy Movie Museum. Uh, sorry, we started a little bit late today. We had a little technical problem, but uh, we're, we're getting organized. Uh, you know, today I've got uh, a special friend with me. We got together uh, recently, uh, well, it was this year at, uh, at a convention, um, who, this is my friend uh, who has uh, been um, involved in the Ninja Turtles since the very beginning of the movies. We're here to talk about Ninja Turtles and today's guest was Raphael in the original uh, Ninja Turtle movie. Uh, he, um, yes, that's him. Look, he looks so handsome. I'm sure he'll tell you that too. Um, he was uh, a little younger when, uh, when he started that, but he's still a good looking guy, my friend. Ken Scott, and uh, hey, here he is. Well, hey, Nick. It's really great to be here with you. It's good to see you through our virtual channels. It was great to spend time with you. I think you and I got together in Pensacola, Florida early this year, and uh, now it's great to visit with you now online. That's, that's where it was. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've got a whole bunch of photos here that we're going to go through today. So it's not going to be all just two guys sitting here chatting. Um, but it's an interesting story because I was uh, I was looking at um, at your book. Here it is. Look at this. The teenage from teenage ninja to mutant turtle. I mean, uh, it's an interesting story. And I love the way that you used the, the you know, teenage mutant ninja turtle title and twisted it around for your book. But we, we'll get back uh, more to your book a, a bit later. Um, it must have been quite a quite a challenge, I imagine, to have spent so much time um, in a big rubber suit. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, we were all sort of in shape and ready for anything when we went to make this movie. Um, I've been a martial artist my whole life, so I brought that level, a high level of athleticism, what we were doing. Um, there were several other martial artists, some dance, a dancer, an acrobat. Um, we were all like highly qualified to do this job, but once you put on that suit and you're wearing 60 or 65 pounds of foam latex and mechanics and other pieces, boy, it really limits what you can do in terms of your physicality. And then also it becomes really just a challenge in terms of the biological processes of life. Like it's very hard to breathe in the suit. It captures your own carbon dioxide right in the mouth. So you get tired really quickly. You sweat like crazy because there's no way to breathe. We were sweating out probably nine or 10 pounds of water weight every single day. And they don't give you an opportunity to take a pee. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is they don't give you an opportunity, but to be honest, you don't really need it when you're in one of those suits because you're sweating so much there's no moisture left in your body to filter out any way. So that was actually something that kind of worked out. You didn't have to go to the bathroom that much because you had no water in your body at all. But I have to say, as a designer of creature suits, um, what I'm seeing in your photos doesn't look like a fun suit to wear. You know, <laughs> those kinds of suits uh, that, are, that are more or less solid foam just kind of bake you in there. And you talk about 50 or 60 pounds. Um, you know, that is, uh, that's a, that's a nightmare to try and, um, try and, uh, and carry around all the time, let alone to try and do ninja turtling in. I mean, uh, ninja turtling is a rather acrobatic uh, thing to try and do in a, it, when you're inside a rubber ball. Yeah, it's very physically demanding. And then what would happen is in between takes, uh, sometimes we would be wearing the heads for 20 minutes, sometimes it'd be two hours. But by the time you pull your turtle head off, we had oxygen tanks standing by, just like on the sideline of an athletic event. And like athletes, we were just sucking down oxygen, drinking Gatorade as much as possible, had fans turned on us, ice packs put on the back of our necks. So there's a lot of work done to keep us functioning and alive. Where were you doing that? We shot the first two Ninja Turtle films in North Carolina. Uh, with just a couple of days in New York for some exterior stuff. 
Yeah, because those suits were built uh, through Henson, weren't they? Through the, I mean, I would say the Muppet Workshop. I always think of Henson and the Muppet Workshop as being one in the same because they were filming the Muppet Show in England. And so the, the workshop was um was where they were doing that stuff um but um i'm guessing uh it, it, obviously it was a completely different crew that must have been putting these suits together for you no actually you're right on the money they flew us out to london to go to the henson creature shop to get the suits to get our bodies cast made and, and then they, sculpt, they sculpted and created all the suits over there and then they shipped them over to the states uh for the filming okay. so we actually flew to London a few times to get fitted, to get uh, the suits put on, to practice with the puppeteers in the suits while they were putting everything together. So it was back and forth. I earned a lot of frequent flyer miles that year. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. Well, and let's go back a little further than that because um, you you didn't actually start as a Ninja Turtle, did you? You uh, kind of started as this guy. Yeah, I started as a little baby first. That was my first job, being a baby, being an adorable baby. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had a job like that too. I guess this is, I guess this is mom and dad. Yep, that's my family. Uh, we were originally from New York. And then when I was five years old, uh, about the time of this picture, we moved from New York to North Carolina. And that's where I grew up in the States. And which of these two is you? I'm the one on the left, the little one. The little one. Okay, so yeah. you were the baby of the family. Yep. Does, that, does that mean you were spoiled? No, I would say far from spoiled, but I had a lot more leeway to do whatever I wanted. My brother Steve, that you see there on the right, um, he grew up and became a very successful hand surgeon, but he was the first kid. So like many families who have the first kid, the parents are always super protective. They don't want anything to happen. So the kid has a lot of rules and things. By the time they figure out that kids are basically indestructible, that kid, when the second kid rolls around, they kind of let them do whatever they want. So <laughs> I was kind of free to be the daredevil and the adventure-seeking guy. Um, so I had a lot of leeway to do a lot of stuff. Is this the adventure-seeking guy? Is this him? I, I can see you've, you, you've got the beginnings of a, of a martial artist in this photograph. Yeah, this is a, I, I knew I wanted to be an action hero in the movies very early on. So I started practicing my posing early. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. And and I, in your book, you talk about, um, you know, having some uh, in, schoolyard incident that, that led you to your karate classes. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I was in the seventh grade. I was 12 years old at the time. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm still not a very tall guy, so I was a small kid. And it was during class, one of my teachers sent me to run an errand up to the office or something. And as I was walking through the hall, it just so happened that a new kid in school was there. And I guess he was skipping class or something, but he and his buddy jumped out from behind the lockers and they, he got me in a headlock and he basically slammed me to the ground in a professional wrestling move. And it hurt pretty bad. Um, but I was just walking down the hall, minding my own business. And this kid jumped out of nowhere and just, you know, laid me out. And, um, I, I felt very helpless. I hated the feeling that I had in that moment. And I cried and it was terrible. And there was nobody there to help me. And he just ran away laughing at me. And from that moment forward, I kind of decided I didn't want to feel like that anymore. And, um, I knew a friend of mine who took karate and had protected himself once before in a fight. So I went and I found and talked to him and and, and ultimately enrolled in karate class uh, to try to figure out uh, so that I would never feel like that again. And so somebody that, came that, to that sounds like a scene from a Chuck Norris movie. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's got all the elements there. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether um, this is supposed to be a photograph from that time or whether this is another occasion. No, this is, um, this is me in New York when I was probably about four years old. And what happened was I was so adventurous, I was constantly breaking bones and getting hurt and um, just doing different things. I jumped off the top bunk bed with a, 
a towel pinned around my neck trying to be Superman. And so I'd constantly get hurt. So this picture, actually, my parents got in trouble because one time I broke my arm. And when I went to the hospital, I had to get a cast taken off my arm, but put on my leg on the very same day. So the doctors actually called the police <laughs> because they suspected that my I was a domestic abuse or child or abuse. Child abuse, of course. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, they called the cops, uh, my parents. And the cops came and had to interview me and the parent. Turned out everything was okay. It was just me being an idiot kid. But yeah, the doctors recognize that because I have to show up so often. Yeah, and it wasn't. Um, it was a little while later when I think when they uh, when they took this one. Yeah, uh, it was later on when I was twelve years old. This is about twelve or thirteen, somewhere in here, fourteen maybe in this picture. And I started taking karate, and um, man, I just fell in love with it. I, I trained all, every day. I went to karate tournaments. It really opened up a whole new world for me. While other kids were playing football or soccer, baseball, basketball, whatever it was, karate is what I got into. And, you know, you're talking back in 1979 now and fast forward now to 2021, 2022, basically, and I'm still doing it. So it stuck with me. And, uh, yeah, I've loved it ever since. It, it became my passion and probably – the single most defining factor of my life. It, it, it allowed me to achieve the things I've achieved. It allowed me to get the roles in movies that I got. And it also has shaped me as an individual and as a man growing up to be who yeah, I am. That's, that's pretty well bound to, um, you know, to have that impact. Um, and uh, is this later or earlier? When is it? Yeah, that's actually probably the same photo shoot in the backyard. Um, I was getting my dad to take pictures when I was practicing. You've got a stuff. very, a very determined look on your face there. I mean, this is, this is, uh, yeah. I don't know if you're trying to play the mean guy or, or, or be the hard man at 12 years old, but you definitely, you know, look like you're saying, "Don't mess with me." Okay. I, I think I was probably concentrating very hard so I didn't hit myself with those nunchucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be painful. I'm sure. Yeah, when I was when I was a kid, I used to practice the nunchucks quite a bit. And um, and in the in the Ninja Turtle movie, in addition to playing Raphael, I also play one of the main foot soldiers, the bad right. guys that work for the Shredder. Right. And there's a scene in the first movie where Michelangelo faces off against one of the bad guys and has nunchucks. And Michelangelo goes, "Oh, a fellow chucker, eh?" And they do nunchucks back and forth. Well, because of my nunchuck skills. I actually got to play the bad guy who does the cool. nunchucks back and forth against Michelangelo. So when I was a kid practicing, um, I used to wear a skateboard helmet because I would hit myself in the head all the time. And so that protected me a little bit. And is this, uh, is this from that? Um, I mean, I'm looking at those swords. Am I wrong in thinking that this is from Ninja Turtles? Well, you, you would be correct in identifying the weapon, but this photo was probably taken... 10 years before Ninja Turtles was made, you know, maybe not quite that much, but when so I was- So you were rehearsing, you were rehearsing. Yeah, I, <laughs> I knew, as, as I talk about in my book, Nick, um, as I'm sure you're aware, from the time I was 13 years old, I decided I wanted to be in martial arts movies. I wanted to be an action hero. And so in order to do that, I did everything I could to pursue my goal. I, I took acting classes, uh, I tried to study filmmaking. I practiced fight choreography. And back in the 80s, uh, when, when a lot of this was going on, there was a big ninja craze going on in the movies. Shokasugi was making movies for Canon Films. He was making Enter the Ninja, Return of the Ninja, all these other things. And so there was a big ninja craze, and I wanted to be a part of that. So that picture was me putting together my own ninja outfit. And then I went to the place in Greensboro, North Carolina, that felt looked most like Japan, which was down by this little creek that we had. And I just sat there and posed for ninja pictures while my dad took some photos. And I made that part of my uh, package to start sending out to producers or whoever I could to yeah. try to break into the movie. People, people today have no idea what uh, you know what it was like 
to not have this whole line of communication that we have now this this uh, you know this youtube come facebook where just about anything that you want to look up or or connect with is basically available there you know in our day we 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 had we had very limited means of tracking down who were the people to send your photographs to or, or what it was that you needed to study. It wasn't at your fingertips the way it is today. Right. Yeah. Today, um, there's basically, um, you know, the Internet is totally everything's accessible to us. We can mm -hmm. see and hear whatever we want, learn about whatever we want. But back then, you really had to pursue it, had to go to the library had to watch public television, uh, do whatever you could to try to find the information and then get it out to other people. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of your um, career in movies seem to be related to uh, Pat Johnson, um, who who I believe was um, you know, instructor with uh, Chuck Norris, uh, original Tang So Do. Did I pronounce that right? Tang So Do School, um, and was training uh, Pat uh, Marita and Ralph uh, Macchio for the Karate Kid. Am I am I right with that, or am I getting that all wrong? Well, either my internet's gone down or yours has. Um, I'm not sure which it is. You've disappeared. Okay, so I guess I'm I'm still here. So, <laughs> you know, one of the difficulties of uh, of dealing with uh, you know live broadcast, live streaming. Um, is the fact that uh, it, it, these things just happen. The internet is a great thing, um, but it comes and goes. And <laughs> sometimes we uh, we just don't have the bandwidth that we need to uh, see that through. I'm hoping that Ken is going to reconnect with me um, shortly. I see Anna Lee. Anna Lea is uh, with us uh, today. Hi, I'm... I'm Pleased to see you there. We got Christy Taylor too. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to say a moment here about Streamyard. Streamyard is um, is something that uh, I use a lot. Uh, I, you know, everyone's everyone seems to like Zoom these days. I, I, it was the first to really get into the marketplace, um, but um, I'm afraid it. Uh, I find it really much more complicated than StreamYard. StreamYard have been wonderful in the way that they have um, that they've come to us uh, in, and supported our foundation, uh, and really have sponsored us uh, through doing all of these broadcasts. And so I'm really grateful to them um, for 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 doing that. If you are interested in doing streaming, I would really recommend them to you uh, because it's a very simplistic way of getting online and streaming to Facebook and YouTube and uh, various other uh, ways. I've got quite a lot more photos uh, uh, here to share about uh, Ken, but I think unless Ken can reconnect, it's going to be hard for us to uh, to finish that. Yeah, Facebook user, I'm not quite sure who you are, but do give it a look because it's a it's you know I use it because I think Zoom gets extremely complicated. You can get in, you start to share something, uh, and then you can't find. Uh, where you are. It gives you a lot of options, but I'm afraid uh, it's not, you know, it's options that you really don't need. Um, StreamYard is very simplistic. You don't need to download. You just need to, uh, you need a Chrome browser. That's it. And then you can talk to people right now, right here. I'm looking uh, to see um, 
messages from you that you're posting. Kira Bentley is telling me that she misses our exhibit so much. And we miss you too, Kira. We want to, we want to see you here. We want to, um, we want to see all our old friends here. Uh, Lelaney is, uh, is a friend of both Scott and mine. Um, and she was uh, one of the um, players in the Mandalorian. So I'm really pleased to see you uh, to see you here, um, sweetie. It's great to see that. What is this? How, I'm being asked, how is the museum? Are the cruisers coming back? Well, actually, this month we have actually seen quite a few of the cruisers um, coming back to us. They, uh, it, it's been the first months where we can honestly say that things are looking up, um, and I'm and I'm really grateful for that because it's been an extraordinary ride to try and keep a, a twenty a, a two thousand square foot museum running through twenty months of no income. It's been a struggle, and we couldn't have done that if it hadn't been for our Patreon supporters, uh, people who make a small donation and, in some cases, a big donation every month to help us keep going and get through this horrible economy. I know it's been hard for everybody, but um, it's particularly hard for a, a, an island that is totally dependent on tourism because there's, there is no economy here that you can say uh, um, uh, can support anything. The only, the whole economy is based on tourism. And if people are in lockdown in the US and people are in lockdown in the UK, well, then uh, they don't get on planes and come on holiday. So Lelaney's telling me that she misses me too. I, it's great because she's she and her. Uh, I, I'm. I think it's Lelaney is the daughter or the mother. I, I'm. I'm getting confused there. Um, but um, you know, the two of them are uh, are in uh, the Jawas in the Mandalorian, and uh, they are the cutest, sweetest uh, ladies that you could ever expect to to find. So if any of you are anywhere near a um, a convention where they're, they're taking place, do go and see. Uh, go, go and see them because they're great people. What else we got here? Um, where's the best place for us to view our broadcasts is it facebook or is there a better place to participate well uh, we broadcast at the same time into youtube um the thing about youtube is i, I think often the streams are a little harder to find um uh, before before it happens and i'm not quite sure which um give us the best uh, give us the best results but um but what I, what we do is, you know, Facebook, after a period of time, these videos disappear. YouTube, they don't. And so we use YouTube as an archive for these in-depth discussions. And then we break these up into small sections that have, uh, you know, individual themes. Combine them and edit them and then do releases of those um, every week or so. Um, and so I would encourage everyone uh, to, you know, join us on, you know, subscribe on uh, Facebook. That was, is Nick Maley, that Yoda guy is the channel. Uh, and you can connect with us on, uh, on Facebook. And, um, oh, sorry, I'm just seeing another message there. You can join us on Facebook and then you won't miss anything because uh, these in-depth discussions uh, have been, they're not something that happens every single week, but we do post something every single week. And, uh, you know, I just recently posted uh, a, a memory of working with George Lucas and Alec Guinness. That was the latest uh, piece that went up uh, just a couple of days ago. I'm going to broadcast that through Facebook uh, fairly soon. The, 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 we've had others before talking about how 
uh, it wasn't Han Solo that uh, was in Carbonite, it was only his face. We've had uh, others that talk about how, uh, how Yoda started out as a Smurf. And the way to connect with those is to, is basically to subscribe to us on YouTube because that's where um, all of those videos reside. So let me see. Someone saying hi from Central California. It's a while since I've been there, Crystal, uh, but I'm pleased to see you here. Uh, any new Star Wars secret projects? Uh, Kira, no, not for me. I do have a couple of projects that I'm hoping might come to something. I was recently talking to a production company about two or three different projects. Um, but, you know, talk is cheap, and often those things don't come to anything. Uh, you just talk and talk, and it, it really doesn't happen. But um, we uh, we have uh, something else that I've been talking to a couple of supporters about. Um, we, we'd like to try and do a, a, a series. Um, but I'm not sure at this stage whether that will ever come to anything, so I can't really talk about it in any detail facebook user you can get around this facebook user hello from puerto rico say hi to eric santos who is that eric santos good to see you huge hug for nick eric santos is a good friend and often works as a as an agent for me in puerto rico it's true eric that uh, i first went to puerto rico that i did puerto rico comic con and um and and it, without that invitation, I would never have got together with the Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra, which has been a great thrill for me over over the years. I I love those guys. And there's a video about that on uh, on on YouTube too. I think that was uh, that was a week ago. I did that um, with um, with the first Yoda puppet uh that i built well it doesn't look like ken's gonna come back i'm gonna hold on and hope that we hope that he does and if he doesn't and i guess we'll pick up the second half of this um in a week or so but if you guys have got any questions at all i would ask you to ask them now while we're waiting for ken because it would be uh it's a perfect opportunity for me to look at this and see how it goes so uh, Kira is saying, hope to see it be amazing as usual. Definitely uh, hope to visit the exhibition again soon. Well, you know, with the exhibition has been under threat through this whole period. It's been a, it's been a real struggle. And Ken's just come back, so we're going to get started again in a minute. But I'm going to finish this question. Um, it's been a real, real struggle um, through the period because for seven months they actually locked down the port and the airport, so we didn't have one tourist, so we didn't have one person come in, but we still had seven months' rent. Uh, we had to lay off the staff and, and stuff like that. Then, um, you know, then when people did start to come back, all the bills went up because people thought we were earning money uh, when we were just uh, struggling through. I'm hoping that now as we go into this season, everything's going to improve. Anna Lee, I'm going to get to your questions later, maybe after Ken. Ken's got another engagement, so i got to go straight to him and uh, make sure that he's free by the time he uh, he gets back from that. And what about this? Here's Ken. Hey, hey, Ken. I'm I, sorry. I lost it. We lost you there, but we, we just, you know, I just kept talking. What can I say? <laughs> well, I wish I could have heard, but I disappeared into the matrix. Yeah, right. What I had said when you vanished was um, that, you know, your, your career um, in stunts and also in, in um, in the Ninja Turtles um, was impacted by Pat Johnson, as I understand it, who was the original Tang So Do, if I pronounce that right or wrong, you'll tell me, school uh, for uh, Chuck Norris that trained uh, Pat and Ralph for the Karate Kid. Yeah, that's exactly right. Pat Johnson is kind of like karate royalty. He was um, Chuck Norris's friend 
And when Chuck Norris opened his first karate schools, one of the first one was Sherman Oaks Karate, where they taught Tong Soo Do, and Pat was the chief instructor there. But Pat's also very famous, like you just mentioned. He was the fight choreographer and stunt coordinator on the original Karate Kid movies, and he taught uh, Mr. Miyagi and Daniel Son how to do their stuff in the movies. And he also appears in the original Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. So uh -huh. he goes all the way back to the beginning of like the martial arts explosion in the United States. Right. So he was the stunt coordinator and fight choreographer on Ninja Turtles. And I had never met him previous to that, but I knew who he was based on me growing up in the martial arts and That's competing. Cool. So to go audition for him um, was a nerve wracking experience. And if it wasn't for years of martial arts, allowing me to remain calm in an otherwise, uh, you know, fraught, nerve fraught situation, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how I would have done, but it turned out that it worked out well. And Pat, um, not only to me, but Pat became very much of a father figure and a mentor to all the, what he called the action team that was working under him. He yeah, really, I, 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 reading your book, I got the feeling that he was, uh, you know, the Mr. Mariotti to your Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. He, he very much so. He was, uh, he was, he disciplined you. He told you what he wanted. He treated you like a dad with love, but also with a very firm hand, if that's what was needed. I remember one of the first things I experienced with Pat was he was standing by the door of the sound stage, and call time was eight o'clock. And as each person walked through the door, he would say, good morning, Ken. It is now 7.59. Good morning, Jim. It is now 7.59. And then somebody else walked in. He would say, good morning. It is now 8 o'clock. Then somebody walked in and he said, good morning, John. It is now 8.01. You are late. If you ever plan on being late again, do not come to work. And it was like, <laughs> we never, you weren't late. You did everything you were supposed to. You were on your spot and on your marks when you were supposed to be there. And you listened and you followed orders when you were working for Pat. It was a yeah. great experience. Uh, serious. Um discipline there i yeah. i've got another photo here that um I, I i'm not quite sure what to make of it i'm sure you're going uh -oh. to explain it to me um there you go all. okay <laughs> this photo is in, this photo is in my book because this photo uh was during my college years and what had happened was i went off to college because you know i, I wanted to pursue my acting career but speaking with my parents and everything, we all kind of felt, hey, it's very smart to go to school, get a degree, try to get some experience in school. Well, like so many people, once I got to school, I kind of got a little out of control. I started drinking a lot of beer, eating a lot of pizza, all this kind of stuff. And I went from being like a highly trained, in-shape athlete to being this doughy, chubby, kind of cherubic kid you see in this photo right here. And so I put this in my book because this is when I saw this picture and looked in the mirror, I realized that I had fallen off my path and I needed to get back on the path and get my body fixed, get myself going again and pursue my goals. Cause otherwise I was undermining my own, you know, uh, attempts to become successful. Yeah, that's, um, that's a hard lesson to learn though, isn't it? I mean, there's a point when, when we're young, we, I, I, yeah. I, one of the things I said to someone recently is, you know, like when you're young, you can't wait to grow up and be an adult. And as soon as you are, you go off the rails and get kind of crazy. And right. a birthday, a birthday is a great, exciting thing because it's a day closer to being an adult. When you when you get uh, past sixty, a birthday is a day closer to being dead. And it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> have the same ring of joy, you know that you have for some of those others sorry i'm getting sidetracked there but uh but you 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 fixed that you got away from being that chubby uh guy um and turned into this guy i did i i knew what was up i knew what i kind of had to do i wasn't exactly sure how to go about doing it but i um i put myself on a very calorie restricted diet I started doing a lot of training and cardio and all that stuff. And I ended up dropping 30 pounds over the course of one summer and uh, got myself back into shape to pursue my goals. So yeah, I got derailed. I, I met a, a, an ogre on my journeys 
and I got sidetracked and I finally I was able to defeat that and overcome it and then, you know, turn into this lean, mean fighting machine. And eventually you uh, graduated from college and I have to say you look really nice in satin. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I knew ultimately that I would like to be wearing flowing diaphanous clothes. So this was really my good start. Funny thing is, I'm drunk as hell in that picture right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, you do look you know, like you're kind of high on something anyway. Yeah, yeah. I was drinking champagne uh, that day. That was my college graduation. And this was my parents meeting me back in my dorm room after the ceremony was over. But me and my buddies had all brought champagne in under our robes and uh, we're drinking it like crazy. So, yeah, that was a that was a fun time. I graduated in college, college in four years with a grade point average of two point three. OK, yeah. but um, but, you know, it's interesting you, what you're touching on there. And I'm, I'm going off on the sidetrack slightly. Um, hopefully you'll forgive me. Um, you know, where you say, oh, you wanted to do your acting and you wanted to do other things. But your family said to you, oh, it's good to go to school and go and get a, a degree and other things. It's a classic thing that happens to people who have a vision for what it is they want to do and where it is that they want to go. That family members and, and, and traditional wisdom will tell them that they should invest for Four years in getting a degree um, in preparation for failing, right? And failure shouldn't really be an option. If you if you don't have a backup plan, you make sure that whatever happens, you succeed. A backup plan just actually encourages people to uh, you know to accept defeat and move on to move on to something else. Uh, in my book, I say. You know, it's normal to take your standards from the people around you, but don't forget another word for normal is average. And uh, average people get killed in video games. If you're gonna, if you're gonna um, accept that as being the standard that you want to work to, then you can't expect to live an exceptional life, which you and I have both done. Yeah, and I very much enjoyed a lot of your philosophies in your book because it did ring true with a lot of things that I had felt sort of blazing my own trail if you if you if you take that way um i do a lot of counseling now for young people who want to become performers whether in music or acting or anything and um i do that because i didn't have anybody do it for me i was right. just a kid in north carolina i didn't have anybody to model my behavior after or ask questions about how to go about finding success i just kind of winged it and if, you know, certainly like anybody, if I could go back now and do it again, there's so many different choices that I would make, but that's because now I have the, you know, the, the grace of all this time and wisdom uh, yeah. to look back. We, we, we have experience now um, of, uh, uh, of where it is, but, you know, in my, in my case, it was a matter of a very long time before I could honestly say I was making a living. Oh, yeah. You know, I wasn't doing it in, you know, in my, uh, you know, around when I was 20, I got into the movie industry, but I was still, uh, that didn't mean I was getting a lot of work. It meant I was the new kid on the block that people called when there wasn't anybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, and people would often say, oh, you've given this a try, but, you know, don't you, don't you think that maybe you should, you know, go for a regular job now. Um, and one of the hardest things when you are trying to achieve something extraordinary is to keep going through all the negativity that other people throw at you because it's a very much a negative world where everybody, whatever it is you want to do, if it's not average and standard and a normal thing for people to do, people go... Um, yeah, but the chances are against you. So, you know, do this as well and do that as well. And they mean it in the nicest possible way. Um, but it, but it's, it's hard to keep going through that. It's an emotional, a difficult emotional time. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I face that from my family as well. You know, years can go by and it's hard as an actor and you struggle and people want to be like, Hey, haven't you done this long enough? Shouldn't you do something else? The key phrase that I think you, you know, you were sort of talking about when parents say, 
oh yeah, so set yourself up in case for failure by having yeah. something else to do. The key phrase, and I, and I did this when I was talking to a kid with a parent the other day, the parent said exactly what my parents said to me, which was go to school so you have something to fall back on. Yeah. And that phrase, something to fall back on means that you failed at the thing you were originally going to set out to do. Actually, right. And I said to that parent, I go, look, it's okay for you to try to convince your kid to go to school because yes, he can go to school and learn his art even more and get experience, but don't use the phrase something to fall back on. Say things like go to school so you know how to handle yourself. So you have other things you can do to sustain your existence while you pursue your dreams. Yes, absolutely. You know? So because dreams dreams like that are things that you edge towards if you expect something to just happen in a flash it's going to you you're going to you're going to be sorely disappointed if you expect it to be really difficult then you're never disappointed when it's difficult it's what you expected and if it goes easy well then you're elated uh, the, and the and the issue is to try and keep edging closer and closer and closer to where you where you're trying to go uh, and and you're absolutely right about the way you phrase that is actually perfect to say you know to give you more diversity while you are moving to to help support you while you are moving towards your dream right yeah uh, too many people have their dreams squashed anyway let's get back to these photos otherwise we can we can talk about philosophy i think you and me for uh, for mm -hmm. you know for the no for the rest of the hour but anyway let's let's just uh, jump through here because i think you're trying to be really cool in this photo what's <laughs> this was uh i worked as an extra trying to break into the movies there was a movie studio that they built in north carolina and it was down near the beach which is about three and a half four hours from where i lived so during my summers in between college classes I would drive down to Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, it was a movie studio built by Dino De Laurentiis, the famous mm -hmm. producer uh, who did Serpico and so yeah, many other know. movies and Flash Gordon and on and on. So he built this movie studio. I would drive down there during the summers and just do whatever I could to break into the movie business. I just didn't, again, I didn't have anybody to model after. So I was just finding whatever I could. So I went down there, I would get myself an apartment, and I would try to get a job working as an extra. So this is me actually being an extra in a police station on a movie called Collision Course, starring Jay Leno and Pat Morita, who went uh -huh. on to make Karate Kid. So they made a buddy cop movie where Pat Morita was a cop from Japan and uh, Jay Leno was a cop from Chicago, and they had to team up uh, to get some mission accomplished. And I'm just in the background being a drug dealer in the police station. <laughs> okay and that was actually how you how you worked your way into movies i think uh wasn't yeah it? but by sort of uh you know getting to know the people that cast the extras um i eventually met some because i snuck onto the movie lot i was trying to figure out how to break into the movies and somehow inside this movie studio which was surrounded by a great big fence I just knew that there was some sort of chalice. There was some goblet waiting for me on the other side, the Holy Grail. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that everything I wanted was inside that movie studio. So I was trying to figure out how to get in there. And every time I worked as an extra, it was always somewhere else on location, but never in the studio. So finally, one day, I, uh, I got myself a Domino's pizza delivery uniform and a couple <laughs> of pizza boxes. And I just drove up to the security gate. You could never get away with this now after 9-11. But I drove up to the security gate and I just said, hey, I've got a pizza delivery for the movie production. I didn't even know they were making a movie. I just figured they were. So he, the guy just let me drive right onto the lot, told me where it was. So I snuck onto the lot dressed as a pizza delivery guy. I ended up meeting the people that were in charge of casting extras and stuff on that movie. Um, we got to talk about martial arts. They told me about a martial arts film that was coming very soon. They couldn't tell me much about it. It was secret. They couldn't tell me the name. But if I wanted to audition, they were going to be hiring local people to basically be bad guys and get beat up. So I got very excited by this prospect. I didn't know what was up. And then a couple of months went by, and eventually I got a call, and they said, hey, we've got that movie that we told you about. We'd love for you to come to audition. 
It's called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we need local martial artists to play all the bad ninjas to get beat up by the main turtles. Do you want to come okay. on? And so, that's like, but that's that's like falling on your feet. I mean, really, for for that to be the first time you got into the studio uh, and to get that connection that made that happen just helps people understand that dreams do actually sometimes come true. Uh, you need to, you know, you need to have faith and 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 keep going at it. Um, that's the key, Nick. Like we, you know, you have to keep going at it. You have to keep. Trying things. If I didn't get that pizza delivery uniform and sneak onto the movie lot and all that, it, all these things never would have transpired. But I knew inevitably. It's like Napoleon Hill in Think and Grow Rich. He's, there's a secret to being successful. And that secret, it, he never says what it is, but he gives you examples of people living it. And it's, it's the feeling that your destiny is inevitable and you're just going to keep going after it to make all those things happen. You know, you'll, you'll, you won't take no for an answer. And that, yes, was, that, that was is, that's absolutely true. You know, I talk about, uh, in, in the book, I talk about how the people who fail are the ones who give up. Uh, but what you're talking about, that sense of belief in yourself, um, is, is, is also key to it. I had a, I had a girlfriend who, who left me and went to the U S, uh, for three months and never came back again. And I wrote her a letter. I remember, uh, I'd be about 20 at the time. I wrote her this letter telling her that she'd made a big mistake and that I was gonna, I was gonna get to be famous making movies and I was going to, uh, you know, be well known. And then when I was about 60, I'd be an artist and I, I laid all of this stuff out and then I would write a book and do whatever. You know, I wrote all of this. She probably read it and thought, oh, what a fool this boy is, you know. But, um, but you know, I'd actually done most of those things by the time I was 35 because I believed that I could do it. And, right. and what was more to the point probably is that I knew that I didn't want to spend my life doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, you're dri we're driven by, you know, the carrot or the stick, right? I don't yes. want that, so I'm going to run away from it. I do want that, so I'm yes. going to run towards exactly. it. Yes, I, and I, 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 say to, I say to youngsters, you know, go in a general direction. Don't try to lock yourself into I'm going to be this absolute specific thing, but say, look, I, you know, I want to be in entertainment, move towards entertainment and take them, make the most of the opportunities that come to you because like you starting out as an extra being an extra led you to being a stunt guy and being a stunt guy led you to being a being a you know a, a, a key performer uh, and so you know those you can't you can't predict that you can't predict exactly what's going to happen you have to just network 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 and make the most of of whatever comes your way yeah i you know the thing the issue that I see with a lot of young artists, whether in front of the camera, behind the camera, music, whatever it is, is a lot of them will have the belief. They'll, they'll express that they think they're magnificent. And they can do all this, but they don't take the steps to move forward. They don't do the things, you know, you showed a picture of me dressed like a ninja before on a creek. I, I dressed like that ninja and posed like that so that I could put together packages to send to movie producers so they could see what I, you know, I didn't just wait for things to happen. Like I made it happen. I, I got the pizza delivery uniform. I put the pictures together. When I got to Hollywood, I even, because it was so hard to get a break, I even invented my own management company and I printed up letterhead and business cards and I made up a fake manager and I used that to send out submissions and I got jobs through it. So yeah. it was all about finding ways to do things to move forward, not just believing and waiting, you know? Yeah. Well, you, you just say you read my book and, and in there I say build on what you have that other people don't have. And that's exactly what you did. You built upon uh, built upon the, the the karate that you'd learn as a kid, like I built on the makeup that I'd learned when I was a kid, and uh, and used that to separate yourself from the crowd of all the other extras that were standing there that didn't know how to do those martial arts. Anyway, I we've got to move on because I know you've got another commitment. So let me uh, jump to the next photo. That is Pat Johnson in the center in the blue shirt. 
and he's that's me next to him on his left. What's our right? Yeah, it's showing off your muscles. <laughs> Obviously, that's a theme for me, no shirts. And then what you're seeing there is you're seeing all the different foot soldiers from the very first Ninja Turtle movie. That's, okay. the, that's the action team. There's a couple other various people in there. The, the guy in the white T-shirt kneeling down the front, he was a martial arts uh, consultant from Hong Kong. Um, but all the other guys are like local United States martial artists that flew down and worked for Pat, and that was his action team. A lot of good, a lot of good friends on there. I, I guess you had to work out together. Yeah, you know, you're you're aware, Nick. There's a lot of downtime on a movie set. Absolutely. Especially, especially when you're an on-camera performer. People in the crew are working constantly, but when you're an on-camera performer, it's hurry up and wait. So Pat Johnson, who's buff as hell behind me, you can see there. He used to work out every day. So all of us martial artists, the guy sitting in the chair with the blonde hair, he was the world middleweight kickboxing champion. What a great guy. So we, right. all, we all used to just train during the days and work out and challenge each other and do what we could to stay in shape and, and keep ourselves moving. Oh, oh, this, this is um, on, on the sound stage. We used to, uh, this is where we would stay during the day. We, we, we called it our, our headquarters. But as the stunt team, we had a lot of equipment in there we could practice on. So this is actually a picture of me doing some high fall practice. I'm jumping off that paint scaffold to the left and landing in those foam pads uh, just laying on the ground there. So yeah, I was going to say, it, looks, uh, it certainly looked like you were doing a fall, although those pads don't look um i mean that's quite a quite a high fall that you're doing there often stunt guys will specialize in doing landings or doing tall falls so the guys that are doing the i'm saying this but not for you ken i'm saying this for the people that are watching um someone might do might specialize in jumping off of seven story buildings into huge uh, uh, you know, piles of cardboard boxes, uh, and someone else might specialize in the final landing, which is actually uh, maybe fifteen feet uh, coming down into a into a small landing area, or yeah. or or whatever else. Yeah. So th we were practicing because there are just a few small, you know, no matter how low they are, they're all called high falls, right? That's in the stunt world. You always call it a high fall, even if it's just 10 feet or it's a hundred feet, it's still a high fall. So we had some high falls to do in the movie. There's scenes where foot soldiers are falling off of fire escapes and falling through skylights and things like that. And I got to do some of that stuff. So um, I was just so thrilled to do everything. I love roller coasters and bungee jumping and skydiving and scuba diving and motorcycles and all that. So to be able to jump off of something and land in like the, even these sketchy pads was just a thrill. So just in our off time, we used to practice that stuff. And it was like kids in a candy store. Yeah, it's like, you you know, you were you were breaking your leg when you were a kid. So, you know, you just kept on doing the same thing. It's right. like it's like you 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 just made sure you never had to grow up, really. Right. Um, but I guess there was also um, some downtime. Yep. And again, when there was downtime, this is actually, uh, I took this picture because those guys are playing a game called Choi Dai, which is a Chinese poker game that the stunt guys from Hong Kong taught us. And once we started playing, it was like, uh, it was like crack. You couldn't stop playing this game. It was so much fun. So to this day, 30 years later, I still play that game with my brother and my friends and my family. So that was Choi Dai. And that's uh, me and another stunt guy named Paul Beam. And we're putting on our Nomax fireproof suits because we're getting ready to do a scene where uh, the bad guys invade April O'Neil's apartment and it eventually catches on fire. And we had to do some stunts and fighting near some fire, uh, some gas fires. And so we just, say, this, would be, this would be great for Facebook because if you put all of these captions up, <laughs> standing around in your long johns and your underwear but yeah um, <laughs> well, it's, boy, uh, yeah, it's 
extraordinary. Fire is one of those things that I think is always uh, an extraordinary thing for, for stunt guys. I've done movies where literally people were, you know, were set fire to and ran around on fire. That always struck me as a really, a really scary um, stunt to have to do. Well, that was exciting stuff because not everybody got to do it. And as the movie went on, Pat Johnson sort of picked out his couple of favorite guys that he would want to use for the various stunts and things that he wanted to do. So luckily, as the movie went on, I kind of proved myself and did one thing and the next thing. So I kept getting more calls to do stuff. And then when it was time to go near the fire, I got the call from Pat. And that was a whole other exciting thing to do. So very thrilling. Yeah, uh, and it must have been um, it must have been a great uh, a, a, a great career opportunity for you, just generally speaking. So here we've got uh, the two of you. You're not looking exactly. Your your friend here is not looking exactly thrilled. <laughs> well, as you're w well aware, Nick, once you put on a big foam rubber suit like that, it's not the greatest day in the world. It's it's challenging work. That's actually Ernie Reyes Jr. He's a very famous martial artist. In the first movie, he was the stunt double for Donatello. And in the second movie, he came out of the turtle suits and played Kino, the pizza delivery boy. So Ernie's like martial arts royalty. He's been starring in movies since he was a kid. And uh, he and I were in the trailer that day. And if you just go back, can you go back to that picture, Nick? Yeah, no, I can. I can. There's something interesting in there that for people who are interested in the Ninja Turtle stuff, if you look to the right there, you'll see Donatello's head is sitting on that sort of the, the head sculpture. And you can notice all the, the white and black the wires yeah. coming out of the head. And it goes down to that backpack. That computer backpack is actually what was underneath our turtle shells and how the uh, heads received the remote control and then controlled all the servos in the head. So you're actually seeing the full mechanics and computer of the turtle head there. Yeah, that's actually those cables are really heavy. Um, those yeah. look like bicycle cables, but, you know what we call Bowden cables. And yeah. we did start out by using those back in the uh, seventies. Um, but honestly, they um, you know that they, they 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 don't compress because they've got metal interiors inside the plastic. Um, but that all adds weight. That must have, um, that's part of the reason why you're saying this weight weighed you down, um, you know, by 50 or 60 pounds. Yeah. Um, extraordinary, really. So, as a, as a, as a performer, as a human being, what can you say you learned from, from that experience, that experience of going of of, a, of okay achieving what you were aiming for but it's not just a matter of of that there must be something that that it taught you along the way well that's a really big question because certainly it taught me a lot of things and it would be hard to isolate you know and it's my brain is just running amok because i learned so many things i learned so much about the business i learned so much about how to carry yourself um I also learned things in retrospect from mistakes that I made. Um, yeah, we all do, don't we? That's the, the best way I, I say to youngsters, you know, you have to fall on your face in order to learn how not to do that. Yeah. And I did a couple of times, you know, I, I put my foot in my mouth or made some mistakes or took some wrong actions and, you know, got disciplined by Pat Johnson or uh, had a run in with the producers or things like that. So I learned a lot um, just about, professionalism um in what you're trying to do in, I, in, your book, in your book you talk about pat uh, colluding with uh, one of the stuntmen tom de weir um to be sick on a particular day on talkative foot number two so that you could step in and get your sag card that's a that's a a really nice thing for him to do for you uh, tell us more about that yeah, basically, you know, for those that don't know, I started the first Ninja Turtle movie hired as what was called a special abilities extra. I was hired to be a foot soldier and I did the nunchucks and all that stuff. But then early on in the movie, they all of a sudden had a scene 
where one of the foot soldiers had to talk and do something during one of the fights. Well, for those that don't know, when you speak in a movie, that brings you to a whole other level of performance ship where you can qualify for membership in the Screen Actors Guild. If you're just an extra, that doesn't matter. As an extra, we were making $75 a day. But once you say a line in a movie, now all of a sudden you're making $500 for the day or whatever it is, but you can get your Screen Actors Guild card. Well, that's the dream for every wannabe actor to get their SAG card. It's like the first thing you gotta do. So I didn't know that this role was coming up, but I knew that there was opportunities that could happen during the movie where I might be able to earn a SAG card somehow. There's just different technical things you can do as a stuntman. So I wrote a letter. I sat down and I wrote a four page letter to Pat Johnson explaining my goals and my dreams and what I wanted. And I delivered it to his hotel room. Uh, I guess he got it. He did say something later on. He didn't say much about the letter at all. But a few days later, he called me up and he said, hey, Ken, I need you to come over to uh, meet the director right now. We have a scene we're going to shoot where one of the foot soldiers has a couple of lines. And uh, the actor that who was supposed to play it is out sick today. So he can't make it. So if the producer and director approve you, you'll get the role. And then that's going to get your Screen Actors Guild card. And I was like, what? So yeah. Pat walked me over the place, met the director. Well, I did the lines for him. I got the part. I did the part. It qualified me for my SAG card. What I found out later was because of my letter and my relationship with Pat, Pat had actually reached out to that stunt guy, that actor, who was working on the movie the entire time, so he wasn't losing any work, and said, hey, why don't you call in sick that particular day and I'm going to get Ken to fill that role. And so they set it up for me so I would have an opportunity to do it. So it was yeah, really a great a, gift. That's an amazing know. thing for, for someone to do for you in, a, in this kind of industry where very often, you know, people are so worried about their own position that they often don't uh, go out of their way to stick their neck out for, for someone else who could, you could have dropped him in the shit. So, you right. know, it's... And <laughs> and I can never thank Pat enough for that, but it goes back to what we were talking before. It probably never would have happened if I didn't invest the time to write that letter. That write the letter and make the most of every opportunity you yeah. have. You you don't you leave no stone unturned. Uh, you, you know from from my book, I I wrote to the guys who made movies when I was uh, when I was working at college. Um, as a as a part time lecturer at university, um, and I was nineteen years old, and I said, you know, I I I'm nineteen, I'm teaching at university, I must be a whiz kid. Give me a union card, and all I got was a letter telling me they keep my information on file. And if I'd accepted that, then that would have been the end of that, undoubtedly. But I, you know, I pursued it to find out where they held their meetings, and I showed up every month until they knew I was wasn't going to go away. It was two years that I showed up. And and uh, I, I, persistence is what succeeds. It's not talent. Talent is good. It's good to have talent. But you know what? Persistence and reliability, that's what that's what people can count on. Yep. Anyway, I'm moving on to another photo here. This is, uh, I guess, uh, this is our... our our baddies climbing into someone's house. Yeah, this is April O'Neil's apartment. And this is the scene where Raphael, the turtle that I was playing, has just been beaten up and thrown through the skylight and he crashes to the floor and he's unconscious. So he doesn't participate in this fight. Well, he's not in the fight, so I'm actually playing one of the foot soldiers. And this is me that you see crashing and jumping down through the skylight. You can see the broken glass flying out and everything. Yeah. And I'm actually landing in some cardboard boxes that are just below the camera down there. Yeah, uh, camera angle counts for a yeah. lot, right? So again, this was the kind of stuff where, you know, Pat believed in me. He liked what I was doing. So every time there was like cool stuff to do, like crash through windows and, and uh, fall off fire escapes and do, be near the fire, Pat always gave me the opportunity to do that stuff. So every day was like a new adventure. Well, you look like you're having a good time. What can I tell you? Well, that's that's the look of living your dream. You know, yes. what happened was I in they, a green rubber suit. <laughs> yeah, in a green rubber suit. 
Well, what happened was the way that I became Raphael was I was working as one of the foot soldiers. And early in the movie, in one of the scenes, the guy that was the stunt guy for Raphael, they dropped him headfirst into a trash can for one of the scenes. And he ended up breaking his nose when they did that. Well, once he broke his nose, he could no longer wear the turtle outfit and wear the turtle head uh, because of the way it sat on your face. Yeah. So they needed somebody to be the new Raphael or they were screwed. Well, Pat Johnson came to me and he said, Ken, if you can go up to the creature shop, if you can fit into the Raphael suit, because as we know, Nick, they're all custom made for each person. Yeah. He's like, if you can fit in the Raphael suit, you're going to be the new Raphael. So I went up there, I squeezed in all the parts and the pieces and this and that. And then this is me smiling from when I had gotten to realize that I could fit. In yeah. And we've got, and we got some photos of you, um, uh, having the, the, the cast made for yeah. you. You didn't yet, yeah, you know, uh, obviously, um, they did some extra work for you on this, uh, you might have squeezed into that suit at the beginning, but they, clearly they uh, they worked on getting a body cast and stuff for you too. Right? Yep. I got my own custom-made suit on the second movie. On the first movie, I was wearing hand-me-downs. <laughs> okay, got it. And um, and there you are again. So that's, uh, I'm staying, that's the first scene in the movie um, where you see a Ninja Turtle fight bad guys on camera. It's in the subway in New York. This is actually where we traveled from North Carolina to New York. That's Pat Johnson on the right. And uh, we're sort of celebrating at the end of the night, uh, just the work. And, you know, he I never would have been in that position wearing a Ninja Turtle suit, living that adventure if it wasn't for that guy standing next to me. So yeah. that was really just a real special moment being screwed up by some idiot in the back giving me rabbit ears. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it is what it is. What can yeah. I tell you? It, it looks like you you got out into a number of um, different locations where people um, were, you know, pretty close to you. Yeah, this is actually the the producers did an experiment. They took two Ninja Turtles, Donatello and Raphael, and they took the costumes and flew them out to Arizona to do an appearance at halftime at like a big high school football game. Yeah, it was the one and only time that any of the movie Ninja Turtles appeared in public. Uh, they tried it. They wanted to see if it was worth it. It just took so many people to bring the costume from London and then dress them in it that they never did it again. But this was the one time we actually appeared out in public with with people at a, at a football game. That's me and Ernie Reyes Jr. Right. And? Uh, that's Rick Myers. Rick Myers is the world's foremost authority on martial arts movies. Um, he's also an author. He's written many books, and he consults with a lot of Hollywood studios on martial arts film. He was a big consultant on Kung Fu Panda. Well, anyway, uh, Rick was the he wrote the very first magazine article that I was ever in after the first Ninja Turtle movie. He wrote an article for Inside Kung Fu magazine, and um, from that point forward, 30 years later, we're still friends. And Rick was actually sort of my teacher and my mentor to help me in writing my book. He explained to me, yeah, he's, he's a published author. And originally I went to Rick and I said, um, hey, Rick, you know, let's team up. Let me tell you all my Ninja Turtle stories. You write the book and we'll just split the book and get it out to the world. And he said, oh, Ken, that sounds like a great idea, but I'm not going to do it. He goes, he goes, I'm writing a book for somebody else and somebody else. He goes, here's what you need to do. You know, write down at least 50,000 words and blah, blah, blah. And he just sort of uh, taught me what I needed to do because I enjoy writing anyway. It's kind of what I do for a living professionally in marketing and advertising. Anyway, so he was my teacher who helped me get through writing my book. Cool. Yeah. Now, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the Henson Creature Shop and about them um, doing casts of you. You know, one of the things that, that we used to specialize in, obviously for, for making dummies and prosthetics and, and other things, was uh, doing life casts. Was this, uh, is this the only time that you had a life cast done or, or is it something that you, you've done multiple times since then? 
No, I've done it uh, one time since then, I believe, but I had never done it previous to that. So it was a very interesting experience. In these photos, what you're seeing is actually they're applying an alginate to my face. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with that stuff, Nick. But Absolutely. when they made my body cast, they made it with traditional old plaster of Paris bandages, and they make this hard shell around you. Well, when they do your face, they weren't using the plaster of Paris. They were using the, this like sort of gelatinous alginate stuff. Yeah. It was very cold. And they put it on your face. And as you can see by you know the photos, and I think even the next one, they got me cocooned up. And I had to stay like that for, I think it was 15 minutes. Yeah, what they've done what they've done here is they've put a backing on. They've used plaster bandage to put a backing on to keep the alginate in shape when they when they take it off because it's flexible. Alginate is actually the material that the dentists use when they take a cast of your teeth. Okay. And so we would use that. And the reason that it's cold is that they the, the colder it is, the slower it is to go off. And so they've put uh, iced water in there to try and give them as much time as possible to get it on your face in in uh, in one go um but that's not the most part you know the most pleasant thing uh, for an actor and being inside here if you're a person that's claustrophobic um it's it can be a a difficult thing to do. I did a I did a live cast on uh, Anthony Hopkins where he was such a relaxed guy. He actually fell asleep during the live cast, and yeah, he, and he woke up inside the mask and yeah. and and got up with a start. But fortunately, everything had dried by then, and the front dropped off. And I just kind of caught it from it. <laughs> well, they've got um, they have a front half there and a back half, and they so they created a hard shell that's filled with that alginate. And yeah, I was in that thing for 15 minutes, and luckily for me, again, as a as a highly accomplished martial artist, especially at that time, you just kind of zen out. You know, you just start breathing, close your eyes, relax because there's nothing you can do. There's, there's no point. And that, that is what you need to do. And in, in actually in any stressful situation is to try and just chill. Um, and, uh, you know, if you react to something, you almost always do the wrong thing. If right. you can just stay calm, analyze the situation and, and act on it instead of reacting to it, you usually do a hell of a lot, a hell of a yeah. lot better. Um, yeah, it worked out well. And boy, when they take that stuff off, it cleans out all your pores. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but I, I don't think you'd want to do it every week to keep the skin in great condition. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not quite sure what is this. A, is this an underskull that they've got? Here? Yeah, when they, it looks like it's held on with plaster bandage. <laughs> yeah, that's actually the final piece uh, that they make. That's the skull cap, the cowl piece and then they mount the head and all the electronic motors and everything on that skull cap so yeah. that's actually what we're wearing underneath and i think that's actually like a cloth band with some velcro going under okay. my chin if i'm not mistaken um and yeah so that's what they made on the on the sculpting piece and so you can see where the where the blue part comes across my nose that's what broke the first guy's nose and that's why he couldn't wear his suit because the way right. it sits all the weight sits right there on the bridge of your nose and your cheeks. Right. Yeah. And if you hit your face, it's going to smack you in the nose. Yeah. 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 A, a tricky, um, a tricky thing there. Um, and there it is with the head on. Yep. So, they, so they've now mounted uh, the head on. Um, the the eye holes are wide open, but you can see where the actor sees out of. It's underneath the bandana of the turtles. Um. And you can see that somebody's written on the sign in the back there, the turtle torture chamber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to push along here a, a little bit, Ken, because, you know, when before we started this, Ken said, oh, we've got to try and keep this interested and maybe it'll only last 20 minutes. Um, and we've been talking here now for an hour and 20 minutes. And I think you've got another commitment in 10 minutes or so. So we, we I need to push this along. Okay. Um, a little bit here so tell me that's it that's the body cast that they made after i got encased in plaster of paris 
Um, my statue is red because I played Raphael. If you were to look around the shop, the, there's one that's purple for Donatello, blue for okay. Leo, so they can keep them color coded. Uh, but that's me, you know. That's me enjoying myself as a Hollywood star on the set of the movie. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And um, oh, yeah. this is um, this is actually a scene uh, from the second Ninja Turtle movie where we're working with a dance choreographer and we're dancing with Vanilla Ice. And so that's the choreographer that has her back to us. And she's going over the dance moves with us and explaining basically how we're going to do in this nightclub scene. Right. Cool. And this one? You guys, uh, look, this is a demonstration of how hot you get inside a, a, a big rubber turtle suit, right? That's, ex that's exactly why we took this picture. We were working in North Carolina in... 95 degrees in 90 percent humidity in september and when we walked into the trailer to finish this scene where we were shooting outside ernie reyes jr in the middle he goes hey let's take a picture right now to remember how miserable we are and he goes he goes nobody smile don't smile and so we all just looked in the camera and now 30 years later when people look at that picture the exact words they say are Man, you guys look miserable. And I always think, good job, Ernie. You nailed it. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. you know, I, I remember, you, you, I mean, you say that about sweating. You know, I remember Anthony Daniels when we were doing the first Star Wars and the, and the first couple of weeks, they, they you know, took him out in his plastic uh, robot suit as 3PO and, and had him wandering around the desert in Tunisia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's no there's no cold suit under something, you know, that skinny. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm seeing a, a, a row of um, ninja suits here. Those those uh, must have constantly needed repair um, yep. because of what you were doing must have been constantly uh, breaking them down. Yeah, and you can see right there, if you look on the right, on the wood, there's a big blue dot, and then all those suits that you see on the right all have blue lining on them. Those are all Leonardo. And then to the left, you'll see the red dot, and those are like Raphael's feet. So there were multiple suits. Multiple pieces. suits, yeah. yeah. Because they were constantly, because it was foam latex, it was very, very flexible, but it was also very, very uh, delicate. And so they would tear easily or things would go wrong. Plus, you spend a little bit of time in these components, and because they're foam, they absorb all the sweat. And they become just like saturated sponges. Yeah, so I didn't realize them. I didn't realize that they made those out of foam latex, which yeah. is really heavy. And when yeah. you get it up to that kind of size, uh, foam latex is is much heavier than you would anticipate. For as a thin skin on something, it's it's super light. But when you've got big wads of it like that, that starts to uh, that really starts to weigh you down. Yeah. But anyway, you look like you had a good time. Yeah, very much so. Those are the four actor turtles from Secret of the Ooze, the second movie. It's Leif Tilden on the right, Mark Casso, who's got a very interesting story. He actually broke his neck as a gymnast, as an alternate for the 1980 wow. Olympic team. And then wow. he rehabilitated himself and became a Ninja Turtle. So pretty amazing. Yeah, well, he was pretty lucky if he broke his neck and um, and walked away from it. I mean, yeah, had a halo device on for six months and everything. Right. Yeah. Well, you all look like you had um, a lot of fun along the way. Um, this is this is the 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 whole crew from which that's movie? The, that's the crew from uh, the second movie, Secret of the Use. Yep. Right. Standing in the junkyard. Cool. It's fun to look. It's fun to look at that and go back and pick out people and names and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I have one of the. I have. I have a few of these from from Hunchback of Notre Dame and Superman and and other stuff. It really, you know, forty years later, it really makes you stop and uh, and think about those times. What, what's really interesting? Oh, can you go back a second, Nick, real quick? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. What, I can. What's interesting is for me sometimes if I go through this picture to look at people and figure out like where they are now, because this is 30 years ago. And so a lot of people were at the beginning of their career. Some might've even been at the end of their career. Like we had a very famous production designer and this is one of the Latin named Roy Forge Smith. You may be familiar with that name, but he did these movies he, and this was some of his last movies. 
But in the very, very front, the guy in the very, very bottom of the center, who's got a mustache on and some curly hair, um, he basically, I just saw his name. He was a stunt guy on the movie. What? No, go down to the right. But yeah, that guy right there. He was a stunt guy on that movie. Well, I just saw his name on the brand new Marvel Shang-Chi and Legends of the Ten Ring big Marvel movie. And he's the stunt coordinator for that whole wow. movie now. So yeah. it's like, wow, look at that. That guy moved up from one job and now he's doing the big movies. So pretty neat to see that. Cool. I'm going to move on. I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap this up quickly because I know that you've got other things that you've got to do. Um, I is this the Barbara Walters um, interview that you did? Yeah, that's Barbara Walters. She wanted to interview the turtles themselves, not the actors, but the actual turtles for her Academy Awards special. So she came after the second movie was done, spent a day with us. She was a wonderful, wonderful human being. I loved being around Barbara Walters. Didn't know, didn't know her before then. But she was very, very sweet. And then years later, she would say in the press, that interviewing the turtles on her special was the dumbest thing she'd ever done. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I imagine it was pretty hard for you to deliver a lot of dialogue in that, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it's actually the puppeteers who are delivering the dialogue. The guys in the suits, like me, we're doing the complimentary body moves and right. head movements. So we kind of have to be in sync with our puppeteers. So we're listening to them through headphones as they speak. And we're trying to anticipate what they're doing to react. Was the puppeteer moving the jaw or was that mechanical rather than off of your jaw? Yes. Everything, the, the head was filled with 27 different electronic servos mm -hmm. that controlled everything. Lips, teeth, cheeks, eyes, brows. Right. Everything was remote controlled. Right. And and I, I from your book again, um, I haven't got a photo for this. There was something about Keanu Reeves that you were you were playing guitar with him or something. Keanu Reeves just happened to be on the same movie lot in North Carolina when we were shooting the movie, and um, I was walking around the lot one day, and I passed. This is before he was a big big star. <laughs> Excuse me. I passed his trailer, and the door was open. I didn't know it was his trailer. And I heard a bass guitar playing and I've been playing music my whole life. And I just kind of stuck my head in to see who's playing bass guitar. And there's Keanu Reeves uh, from Big Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And he's just sitting on the couch and he's playing bass and he's not playing anything. He's just randomly hitting stuff. And uh, I was like, oh, hey, what's going on? And he's like, oh, hey, I, I just got this. Blah, blah, blah. I'm learning how to play it. I was like, well, I know how to play a song. Uh, I can play Johnny Be Good on the bass, he goes, oh, will you show me? So I walked into Keanu Reeves' trailer and I taught him how to play Johnny Be Good on the bass. That's my Keanu Reeves brush with greatness. Yeah, actually that whole story sounds like something out of Bill and Ted. I mean, they, the dialogue, it almost fits, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you went on to do a lot of uh, things later on, that, you know, you directed uh, your own movie or you directed someone else's movie you did some shorts and was featured in a movie showdown um i don't know how much time you've got but you know tell us what you can about that it you know it's it, it, this all part of sense of evolution when i said you know you network with people and you go wherever you go where where life um, leads you rather than trying to set a course from a hundred miles away that says I'm absolutely gonna you know go in one place tell me about it well you know I kept blasting away every from Ninja Turtles all my dreams were coming true everything was working out my first job out of college was being a ninja in the movies so I was achieving my goal so I was just ready to keep doing everything the same way and moving forward so as soon as Ninja Turtles was done, I bought myself a first class plane ticket to Los Angeles. I moved out to LA and uh, I just started my pursuing my dreams there. And, you know, the first thing I want to do is be an action hero that wasn't wearing a green rubber suit. So I, uh, I did the same thing. I, I mentioned it earlier. I, I created my own fake management company. I created my own fake agent. Um, I put together a phone and, and newsletters and uh, uh, business cards. I put together a videotape of me doing karate in the park and I sent it out to all these companies that make karate movies. And lo and behold, 
uh, Imperial Entertainment, who made Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. They reached out to me through my fake agency company, and um, I ended up signing a deal with them and starring in a movie called Showdown, uh, which was a big international success. Cool. Uh, the cult editions have just recently come out here in America, 20, 30 years later. Um, and then I eventually moved behind the camera to write and direct. I wrote and directed my own feature film called Adventures of Johnny Dow. It's kind of a kid-friendly kung fu movie. Um, directed a lot for the History Channel and Discovery Channels, uh, doing a lot of action sequences. And uh, that was it. Pursued that for a long, long time. Uh, did that stuff and then eventually took my creative talents and moved into the marketing and advertising world. And that's what I do with them now. And I visit Comic-Cons to go see Turtle fans. And that's and what I'm talking about. Like me, yeah. yeah. And I get yeah. to hang out with other artists. It's a great time. I have, to, I have to say, you know, one of the things I really look forward to when I go to do um, autographs at, at a Comic Con is all the other people that uh, we get to have supper with and hang out with and and if I wasn't doing that then we wouldn't be having this conversation here yeah. too you know that's um, all part and parcel of that so someone um, tell me about this this is uh, you, you know you're the you're the best Raphael it says here who who did this that's actually a drawing by Kevin Eastman, one of the creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And well, that's a great that's a great uh, uh, thing to have, I would say. You have that framed on your wall somewhere. Yeah, he actually. Uh, uh, I we we've been together at a couple of different events, and we were actually at a mutual friend's party, and he brought some books that he had written or drawn about uh, the Ninja Turtles, and so he gave me one, and he opened it up, and just on the big front white sheet. He drew that right there at the dinner table. Blah blah blah. Signed it and gave it to me. So I always thought that was cool. Yeah, that's a and that's a, and that's a great um, a great compliment too from coming directly from you know from a creator. So we've just about covered the whole gambit here from uh, you know from the whole uh, karate thing through to your through to your book and and for anybody who wants to uh, know more. Uh, where are they going to get your book? Well, they can start just by going to turtleconfessions.com. That's easy to remember, turtleconfessions.com. Okay. The book is, and that will lead them right to Amazon. But there's all kinds of videos there they can watch. I, I talk about behind-the-scenes stuff and things like that. But there's links to get the book. But you can go directly to Amazon and get the book. Just type in my name, Ken Scott, and you can find it. But it's Teenage Ninja, the Mutant Turtle, Becoming the Real Raphael. And it's only nine ninety nine on Amazon and three ninety nine yeah, on Kindle. It's totally deal. worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And having uh, having gone through that, I can recommend it to anyone who's interested in in you know what it is that happens in the making of these movies because there's a lot of behind the scene uh, stories and information in there too. So I really appreciate that, Nick. Thanks very much. It's been great spending this time with you. Ken, yes, it's been great to see you, and I'm I'm gonna let you escape because I know you got to run to another commitment. But um, take well, care. And let's and let's talk again soon. Let's um, you know, let's get together sometime. Maybe definitely. And I look forward. I look forward to seeing you at the next event too. Yeah. Right. Take All right. Care. Take Thanks, care. Nick. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. So that was the great Ken Scott, uh, Raphael from the first um teenage ninja turtle uh movies i'm gonna i promised that i was gonna answer some questions here from stuff that people said i'm trying to look back to see what it was um kira is saying um she hopes to see it amazing as usual definitely hope to visit the exhibition again I she's talking about the museum here i have to say we are still here and we're hoping that we're gonna you know hold on the season is rolling in and so uh, things are beginning to pick up the question is going to be whether we can maintain it through the through the summer that follows but uh for now things are looking a lot better than they were um uh, Analia was saying she hoped that next year she would study in the Stan Winston School 
to improve her props. Now, I'm going to mention this because I'm a big fan of the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, uh, basically because for uh, about $350, you can have a, a full year of their, uh, of their videos that will tell you um, just about how to do just about everything um, from prosthetics, from sculpting, from puppet building, from prop making. There are so many skills that they, uh, that they give you. And they're all professionals like myself who, who actually work in movies because they wouldn't have the opportunity to teach at a school. They wouldn't have the time to do it, but they can come in and uh, on a weekend and film uh you know a, a particular them doing a particular job so you're being taught by experts at absolute discount prices and if any of you decide to do that please support our foundation by using the subscription code yodaguy20 so uh, having given that little that little plug for my friends there um uh, yes someone wanted Ethan wanted uh, Ken to do the, the the Raphael voice. Unfortunately, he's already gone, so we don't have that opportunity. And as he said, um, the voices were being uh, piped from the puppeteers um, in any case. So I think I'm just looking. I don't know that there are any old suits are extremely hot. Um, should we cosplay? Yep. Yeah, that's about it, guys. So I'm not. Go I'm going to wrap it up now. I'm going to thank you for watching. Um, share this with your friends uh, if you would like to. And as I said, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is Nick Maley, that Yoda guy. So it's what you see on the screen here right now that says that Yoda guy, Nick Maley. Well. If you put that in, it'll come up. If you put Nick Maley, that Yoda guy, it'll come up. If you put Nick Maley, it'll come up. Just subscribe because we're putting out a lot of behind-the-scenes information that's never really been told before. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to sign off here. This is Nick Maley saying, may the force be with you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. I'll see you next time. Take care.